Okay, so we're going to start out with a quick exercise, a, a quick practice on the electrochemical driving force again. We're going to try and really hammer this concept home, and then we're going to keep talking about transport. Part D here. Let's start filling this picture in. I drew a little scribble cell up on the top here, right? So here's our membrane potential of negative 70. We know we're talking about potassium, which we should know is a cation. So we have a positive charge there on potassium. We also have this information that the electrochemical driving force on potassium in the case went outward. We'll think about it. So let's start with the electrical driving force, the EDF. The electrical driving force in this situation going to point in or out? So for this one, we're thinking about what's going on with the charge on the potassium relative to this charge here from our membrane potential. So what, what happens with opposing charges here? We have a negative charge inside the cell and potassium has a positive charge. So are they attracted to each other or are they repelling each other? Yeah. yeah, they're attracted to each other. So for just our EDF, just our electrical driving force, we're gonna be pointing in. So that's, that, that's that attraction of the charge. So, we have to be mass. So, okay. okay, let's think about this part with the electrochemical driving force now. So, we're going to remember what this means before we attack part B. So, 
we'll draw it on. All right, so this is going to be our electrochemical driving force. So we're given the information that that points outward. What is our electrochemical driving force made up of? What do we add together to get that electrochemical driving force? In the two things. Yeah, the electrical force and the chemical force, right? Okay. So we know that when we add this EDF that's pointing in to the CDF, we get something that points out. So which direction is the chemical force going to have to point that? Yeah, exactly. So our chemical driving force here points out, just like our electrochemical driving force does. Okay, so which of those two was stronger, the EDF or the CDF? Yeah, the CDF. Okay. So that was our CDF. Bonus, last one I added on. So now we want to think about what this means for the equilibrium potential. So if we were to figure out what EK is, do you expect it to be like a bigger number? In this case, I mean more negative, or a smaller number? In this case, I mean more positive than that VM of negative 70. Yeah, it's gonna be more negative, right? Uh, so actually it's like negative 94. Okay. So it's stronger. And so we could guess that, right? We could tell that because we think about what happens as we follow this electrochemical driving force. Right? So as we follow this force, this force will be at zero once we reach the equilibrium potential. So we know we are actually going to move until we reach that equilibrium potential. So what we're seeing here is that the movement of potassium ions overall is out of the cell. Right? And every time we have a positive ion leave the cell, we're dropping that membrane potential down. So we become more and more negative until we are at the equilibrium potential. I'm going to do a little bit of practice just in multiple choice question world. <laughs> Now we're going to be thinking about sodium instead of potassium. Another for a couple of seconds. Okay. For our electrical driving force. Okay, great. So sodium is a cation, so it's positively charged. So yes, we should be going into the cell. Okay. So this positive charge on sodium is attracted to that negative membrane. I'm now going to tell you that sodium has an equilibrium potential of positive 60, meaning that sodium will move until the membrane potential reaches positive 60. What direction does that mean our electrochemical driving force would be if we're starting at a membrane potential of negative 70? Sodium is going to move into the cell at positive 
Yes. So the fact that the equilibrium potential for sodium is positive is the case. The sodium is a cat ion, so a positive ion, means that it needs to move into the cell with a membrane potential of negative 70 in order to try to get more and more positive. So it's going to move into the cell when the cell is negative 70. It's going to keep moving into the cell until we get the positive cells. Okay. Let's think about when it gets part way there. Okay, so we're not at negative 70 anymore. Now we're at positive 20. So let's think about the electrical driving force. What's happening now that we've gotten ourselves part way up to that equilibrium potential? So as we move up towards the positive 60, which is our sodium equilibrium potential, when we were in that negative world, right, our negative charge was attracting those positive sodium ions. So before we had an inwardly directed electrical driving force. But now that our membrane potential is positive, we're now going to be repelling those sodium ions. So the electrical driving force is actually flipped as we get farther up. So this would actually be pointing out of the cell now. Just for the electrical driving force, the electrochemical driving force is still pointing in which is going to imply to us, I don't have a question on it right now, but this implies that a large part of why that membrane equilibrium potential for sodium is so high has to do with the chemical driving force, right? So, so we would be accounting for both factors, which is why the electrochemical driving force is still pointing, but the electrical driving force would be pointing out. Um, we'll keep practicing with electrochemical, electrical, chemical on Friday. Um, but if you're getting kind of overwhelmed with how to practice for these, I do recommend thinking about sodium a lot and just varying what membrane potential you're at, positive 20, negative 70, so on and so forth. Um, because sodium is going to be really important when we start talking about neurons. It's going to be one of the main things we're tracking. Uh, so. I do want you to try to internalize this and understand the concept, but just for your success on neurons and exam two, if you have to memorize anything, I, you can make your chart yourself a chart of what direction things happen with sodium when we're negative, when we're positive but below the equilibrium potential, or if we were positive but above. Um, that that would help you out moving forward, but. We're going to do more practicing, so, so hopefully we won't need to do that. Potassium and sodium are going to be the most important. If I pick an anion, it will probably be chloride, so chlorine. And you, I don't expect you to memorize like their equilibrium potentials, or you don't have to memorize any of their movements, but so long as we get this concept solid. But, um, you know, people learn things different ways and sometimes it helps to, to remember more facts. Okay, so when we last talked, we were talking about passive and active transport. You guys have seen this slide before. Talking about passive transport doesn't require energy as pretty tight. We talked about a simple diffusion. It's just directly through the lipid bilayer. So we had a couple of factors influencing the rate of diffusion. 
including the magnitude of the force, how much surface area it has to cross, um, a couple other things like lipid solubility, shape and size, temperature. And we'll just move up. So here you have some checkpoint questions in here for you to practice from later. And now we're going to move in and talk about our carriers and channels. So when we talk about facilitated diffusion, facilitate means like to make easier, right? Or to make possible. So facilitated diffusion is still gonna be passive transport. So it's still not gonna require energy, but it's gonna need a, a molecule, specifically a protein to help it out to make it possible. So in this case, we're talking about something called a carrier protein. The carrier protein is a transmembrane protein, meaning it goes all the way across. Transmembrane proteins are also a type of integral protein, meaning they go through that hydrophobic central layer of our lipid bilayer. And what the carrier looks like is it's going to have these binding sites. So it's not itself an enzyme, but in terms of the shape, it kind of looks like it, right? So we're going to have a binding site on one side. And what's going to happen when we bind in the molecule we are carrying, right? Because it's a carrier. That binding site is going to flip over and pass our molecule through to the other side. So that's how a carrier protein works. We basically have a shape change of the protein when our molecule binds in. And that shape change allows us to shuttle our molecule across our membrane. So the binding is only going to occur on one side at a time. So that's that's what this is showing here. That technically we would have kind of steps to this. We don't really need to worry about these steps for our purposes. So we can see that the binding site is here before our glucose binds in. Now our glucose is binding in, so we have like a second time point. Third time point, we're flipping. Fourth, that glucose is releasing into our cell, into our ICF. And then we have our binding site flipping back to the outside. I think it might depend on the protein itself. I'm not totally sure. So the fact that we do have these carrier proteins means that we're going to need to consider an additional factor when we're thinking about rates of facilitated diffusion compared to rates of simple diffusion. Because now we don't just care about those properties of the membrane or lipid solubility, right? In fact, anything going through facilitated diffusion is not lipid soluble, that's why it needs that protein. So the rate of transport for the carriers, so like how fast that carrier works, how fast it can go back and forth and switch which side that binding site is on is going to make a difference. So that's our rate of transport for the carrier. Also, the number of carriers we have is going to make a difference. Right? So if we have like five of them, we go like five times as fast as if we just had one of them. Right? Conceptually, that kind of makes sense. And also our concentration gradient. That's kind of similar to the magnitude of our driving force that we saw in simple diffusion. So that, that one's similar to our previous case. So in this case, before when we were looking at simple diffusion, I'm just going to kind of overlay the line, right? We just saw as concentration went up, our net flux went up. And it was just kind of a straight line. But that was because we could just go directly across the membrane. We didn't have any intermediaries. So now, when we're looking at facilitated diffusion, we can see that this line is flattening out, right? So we see this flattening out here. So what do you think is happening to make this line flatten out? Why doesn't it just look like that simple diffusion? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the proteins are getting saturated. You're running out of carriers to carry across. You're hitting that, that top rate. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Netflix is basically just like how many and in what direction are flowing across. So technically, if we think about like how this works from a chemical perspective, we're having movement of molecules both in and out, like all the time. So when we say that something moves in or moves out in biology, what we're really saying is like how many more are going out versus are going in. So usually we don't think about the fact that we may have movement in both directions across the membrane. Um, we just say, is it going in or is it going out? So that's what the network is referring to. Okay. So an example of facilitated diffusion that's important in physiology um, is glucose is important. We've talked about metabolism, right? We know we need glucose in order to make ATP. So we have this transporter called glucose transporter four or GLUT4. GLUT4 is how we're going to be able to get glucose into our cell. So those GLUT4 molecules, those proteins, those transporters, they get made somewhere, specifically in this case, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They get packaged into vesicles, which are just like little bags, right, that your cell uses to shuttle stuff around. And we're gonna have basically a trigger that tells your cell to add these GLUT4 molecules into the membrane. So your cell doesn't always have the same number of GLUT4 transporters. Sometimes it won't have them, but after you eat a donut, right, or something sugary, right, you're gonna want to draw glucose out of your digestive system into your cells, right? That's that's part of the point of eating, right? It's getting stuff into your body, actually into your cells. So we have a hormone that triggers this, insulin, and we'll talk about insulin in, in the future. Um, but one of the ways it allows us to get that glucose out of our food is it stimulates the insertion of these transporters into our cell membrane. Um, so one of the problems in diabetes, one of the reasons that uh, Poor regulation of insulin is a problem. So if we don't have insulin, it means we can't put these transporters in the membrane, which means that glucose, even though we want it in our cells, we can't get it there because we don't have this protein in the membrane, which means that the glucose is just going to kind of stay in the blood and it's not going to get absorbed by the rest of the body. So that would spike blood sugar levels if we can't take the glucose out of our bloodstream and put it into, say, muscle cells where we might want to use it. So we can regulate how well we absorb things and when we absorb things by regulating where and when these transporters are inserted into our membrane. So a similar concept to our transporters or our carrier proteins are channels. The difference with the channel is that we don't really have a binding site that kind of switches sides. When we have a channel, we just have kind of an open pore. We will see that we can kind of close them off. Um, but basically, if a channel is open, it's just open all the way across we don't have to have, have this kind of rate going back. But otherwise they're similar. They're transmembrane proteins. They go all the way across, meaning they're also integral proteins. Um, and they are also substance specific. So even though they don't have a binding site, uh, that internal part of the channel is gonna have certain chemical and physical properties that mean that we do have like a channel for sodium, a channel for potassium, things like that. Usually when we talk about channels, um, we'll be talking about ions. It's not like a strict division between channels and carriers, but it's something you'll notice is, is true as we move forward. So we have 
couple different types of channels we might talk about. One that we, when we're not talking about ion channels, we'll be talking about aquaporin usually. Mm -hmm. So aquaporins are channels that allow water to move across the membrane. When we talk about the ion channel, we can also break them down. Uh, we're going to see that some channels we call leak channels that are going to allow a little bit of ion to leak out of cells, basically. We'll see we have some gated channels, and that's going to be really important as we move into neurons uh, next month. Um, usually, or the ones we'll be talking about first, are going to be gated by voltage. So basically, they'll, they'll activate at certain membrane potentials, and we'll talk about how that works. Um, but that's why we want to pay attention to whether they're active or inactive. And some channels will be bidirectional. So like, some channels will let both sodium and potassium move through and they may move in opposite directions. So as we see channels in the future, we'll be specific about what molecules or what ions are able to get through and whether they have to move in a specific direction or not. So there are gonna be factors that affect the rate of transport of the ion channels as well. Um, so, basically the, the same as our carriers. So transport rate, number of channels, and whether they're open or closed. So if the channel exists but is closed, kind of doesn't matter that it's there because when it's closed, it's not doing anything. That brings us active transport, where we'll be seeing the transporter again. So when we're talking about active transport, we're talking about movement across the membrane that is not spontaneous. So active transport is going to require energy that doesn't just happen on its own. Okay? So when we're talking about proteins that move um, molecules by active transport, we'll often refer to them as pumps. Um, so they are transporters, they are membrane proteins. Um, but when we refer to them as a pump, right, a pump you have to like actually move, you have to do something to it to make it move, step across. Um, so if you see something referred to as a pump, you should immediately think active transport. So the movement of our molecules is going to be uphill, Right, so like pushing a ball up a hill requiring energy it means we're going to go from our low concentration gradient if we're thinking about chemical driving forces to our high concentration gradient. So if we're thinking about glucose, right, all we would have to think about is the chemical. There is no electrical. But if we were thinking about an ion, we'd have to make the picture a little more complex and figure out which direction would oppose the electrochemical. We're going up our gradient against our natural direction that our molecule wants to move. So here in our image, we see the okay. So here we see that we have equal concentrations here our solutes on side A and side B. So what would happen in this situation if we didn't use any energy, if we didn't use active transport? Yeah, exactly. So this is a state at which we are at equilibrium. There is no direction for passive transport here, right? We just keep those steady states on either side. There would be no net flux. But if we have a pump, we can pump stuff to the other side. So if we still want to move stuff, even though there's no gradient to move down, we can insert an active transporter, move stuff from side A to side B, which would then create this separate situation that we see in the image below, right? So in the image below, we can see that we've built up a high concentration here on side B. Okay. 
copom is a membrane protein. Functions as a transporter, and we may also say that it functions as an enzyme. The reason we would say that is that the enzymatic function here would be that it breaks down ATP, right? It's this, this enzymatic function kind of, of taking ATP, harvesting the energy and that extra bond between those uh, final two phosphate groups, pulling off a phosphate, giving us ADP, our adenosine diphosphate, our phosphate molecule. So it's basically just breaking down of ATP to release energy that makes pumps kind of an enzyme as well. So they do use that energy, they harness that energy to do the pumping, to do the active transport. So here we see specifically our sodium potassium pump, a great example of active transport that we'll see a bunch. So our sodium potassium pump, sometimes referred to as a sodium potassium ATPase. I will probably just say sodium potassium pump, but you can see both terms depending where you're looking. Okay. This is doing active transport. Now, because it acts as a transporter, so it's kind of a carrier protein, this means it has binding sites. So here we can see in our sodium potassium pump, it actually has three binding sites for sodium. We see three spots for sodium right here. So right here, you can see that those three spots for sodium are pointed towards the inside of our cell. So once we'd have those three sodium bound in, this would be saturated. This individual pump would be saturated. These two spots are actually where our potassium would go. So we couldn't fit any more sodium into this individual pump. When we see active transport where we're, we have that ATP ACE function, where we see the transporter molecule itself using ATP, that's primary active transport. So that's what we were just looking at, right? Point out, right? Our sodium potassium pump is primary transport. A secondary active transport is going to kind of take advantage of the fact that through primary active transport, we can build up gradients. So kind of like what we saw in the mitochondria when we were talking about metabolism, right? We saw that we built up a hydrogen gradient, right? We created an area of very high concentration of hydrogen ions, and then we released it, right? So in secondary active transport, usually going to happen after we've built up some type of gradient using primary active transport. So here we see our primary active transport again. Here we just see the full picture of our sodium potassium pump. So we see our sodiums bound in in this first step. We broke down ATP. Then we can see that the binding sites flipped to the other side. We had this shape change. Our sodiums were released out of the cell, but we're not done. This is a sodium potassium pump. Okay, so we can see that the next thing that happens is our potassiums from the outside of the cell bound on, flipped to the other side, and brought our two potassiums in. And that would kind of take us back to our beginning state. So the energy in primary active transport here comes from a high energy compound, usually from ATP. Right. So usually we're thinking ATP. That's what we see here in image B, right? That's the point at which our sodium potassium pump uses energy. And that's the phosphate group that we pulled off of the ATP. Um, so it's losing it so that it can go back to the original state so we can break down another molecule of ATP. 
than secondary access transport. We're going to start out in a situation where we have a gradient of something existing. Usually it's going to be sodium ions, um, as is the case in this picture. It doesn't have to be sodium ions specifically, but sodium ions basically run a ton of physiological processes through uh, allowing for secondary acid transport. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow our ions, our sodium ions in this case, it could be something else, to move in the direction of their passive transport, so to move down their gradient the way they would want to go. And they're going to carry a second molecule along with them, basically. So the energy of an ion moving down its gradient is the energy to drive secondary active transport. So say we did primary transport, primary active transport of sodium and potassium with a sodium potassium pump, right? And we saw that we could use that pump to build up a bunch of sodium outside the cell, right? We just saw it shoving free sodium outside the cell every time it does its little cycle, right? So this would build up a sodium gradient, now making sodium want to move back into the cell, right? So we could use this gradient, this sodium that wants to move, to take a second molecule along with it. So in this case, glucose. So this would be an example of co-transport because they're going in the same direction, but co-transport is just a type of secondary active transport. So technically it's named secondary active transport because it's like the second step and we had to have primary transport first. Um, I like to kind of think about it easier for, for myself is like we're working with a second molecule. The reason we don't say that officially is because uh, the sodium potassium pump, for example, has two ions, but it's primary active. So it's not always the case that when you see two, it means it's secondary active. But if you see two and one of at least one of them is moving in the passive direction, then you know you do have secondary active transport. Passive being down its grade. If there's if you see two things and one is going the direction you would expect it would want to go, but the other isn't, that's secondary active. So in this case, that's into the cell. But for example, like if we saw something going along with potassium, right? We know that we've just been moving potassium into the cell, so there would be lots of potassiums in here. So its direction that it wants to go would be out. So if it happens to be carrying something with it as it goes out, that, that would still be secondary active transport. So this is our sodium linked glucose pump that we're looking at. So it's for secondary active transport of glucose. The diffusion of those sodium ions provides the energy to actively transport glucose. So this means that if we looked at our glucose concentration, the glucose would be moving against its gradient um, because it's active transport, right? So if we were to draw them on, we would see in this case, because we're doing active transport, we would expect there to be a bunch of glucoses already inside the cell. But we want to get all the glucose from our donut. So we're still pumping more in. Now, secondary active transport can also, instead of like pulling something along with the ion into the cell, it could do something more like if you're going through a revolving door. So you have your ion pushing in, but the revolving door is sweeping something out. So that's what we're seeing in this image. It's still an example of secondary active transport, but in this case, we see that it's counter transport, 
So in the case of a sodium linked proton pump, this is just the name of a specific transporter that does secondary active transport. We see that we have transport of our protons, which are hydrogen ions, in this case, out of the cell, right? And the energy is coming from a sodium gradient that we likely built up using our sodium potassium pump. So the reason it's different from the primary is just because you're not directly using it. Uh, and a note for reading any images like this in your book, anytime you see a red arrow, it's telling you that that's active. Anytime you see a green arrow, it's telling you that that's like the passive direction. Um, so you won't always see figures like this, but um, if you're trying to figure out what's going on in a figure, because they don't always draw in the gradients for you, that's the thing to look at. So green is good, is passive, is the way to read your book figures. So here we see a big chart of what you would require for uh, each of these different types of transport, so our simple diffusion, our passive transport, either through a channel or through facilitated diffusion, so our carrier protein. Then we see our active transport, our two types are primary that uses ATP, our secondary that's using a gradient for energy. You can use this chart to study, scrub it all out, see if you can fill it back in for yourself. So, as we move forward into our organ systems, we're going to see that when you're looking at a specific cell, unfortunately, you're not just usually looking at like one transporter doing one type of transport. We're gonna have big systems where we have primary active transport of one molecule, secondary active transport of another molecule. Maybe we'll have some leak channels allowing for passive transport. We'll have big systems and multiple things going on. Um, so we can think about active passive coordination when we're creating a big system like this. Usually when we're looking at these systems, you are going to see a sodium potassium pump kind of linking things together. Okay. But fundamentally, we are able to have a difference in concentrations inside the cell versus outside the cell, from the ICF versus the ECF, because of active transport. So if we only had passive transport, everything would eventually end up at equilibrium, which would stop movement of everything altogether. So without inputting energy, you can't build up any type of gradient. And if you don't have a gradient, then you can't have passive transport, right? Because it relies on there being a downhill direction. So here we can see, right, our sodium potassium pump used ATP to build up our sodium gradient, right, which allows sodium to move passively into the cell. It also built us up a potassium gradient, which would then allow potassium to passively leave the cell. All right, so we have linked this active movement of our ions to the passive movement of ions. Okay. Didn't make these as uh, full questions, so go ahead and just read them and, and we'll go through the answers. I got a couple things here. So thinking about facilitated diffusion, what would not affect our rate 
A, the transport rates of the individual carriers, so those transport molecules. B, the number of carriers in the membrane. C, the magnitude of our gradient. Or D, the solubility of the molecules in the membrane. Hopefully we pick C because it's facilitated diffusion. It's all about things that can't cross the membrane on their own. They need to go through a protein. It doesn't matter how soluble they are in the membrane. That's not how they're getting into the cell. Right. Another one. We're getting lumped into it. Okay. This one's a, a little tricky. So we want to think about the lung. Think about what would happen if we have fluid kind of accumulating on our membrane. So it is the case that when this happens, we can't get as much oxygen into the blood. So we're going to try to to kind of guess what's happening there. And we will look at this later when we look at examples. But in this case, what's actually happening is that this has to do with membrane thickness. So adding fluid in the lungs almost acts like an increase in the thickness of the membrane. And then we want to think about what might influence membrane permeability to something that's diffusing across it. Okay. The trick here is that when we're talking about the membrane permeability, we're talking about properties that affect the membrane itself. So the liquid solubility or the size and shape of the diffusing substance would affect how easily it can get across the membrane, as with the temperature, as with the membrane thickness. The concentration gradient might affect how fast that molecule diffuses across, but it doesn't influence the overall permeability there. Yeah, and technically the temperature also affects the fluidity of the membrane. So like kind of how fast the membrane is jiggling, almost like you kind of form like, like it doesn't form gas in the membrane, but you can kind of think of it that way. It makes it easier for stuff to move itself. Um, so I think we're going to, yeah, we're definitely going to stop there. Um, so we'll do a bit of review on Friday, and I will check where the other sections are. I kind of doubt anybody's gotten into osmolarity. If they have, we might do a couple minutes on this. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, it's 33 questions, multiple choice on the stuff we've been doing. <laughs> Is that all we do during that class? Yep, that's it.